Welcome to Uncomfortable Conversations about Culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I'm joined by Jess. Hello, world. And Alex. Greetings. And salutations. <laughs> uh, how's everybody doing? Doing okay? Doing great. Doing Having well. a great week. How about you? Huh. I Yeah, it's been a good week. That's good. That's good. Uh, what I, I have a question for you though, Alex, I really, I, I need to know what you can use less of in your life. What can I use it's less just, of? I mean, there's always so much of everything. There's yeah. always more. And a lot of times we, you know, as a society and a culture, we want more and more and more, but what, yeah, what can we use less of? You know, one of the first things that comes to my mind around this time of year is just weeds Ugh. in my yard. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I feel like not like in a dispensary, but no, no, uh, no, but okay. just in my yard because they're, they're annoying mm-hmm. mostly when they pop up inside of my like flower beds, you know, mm-hmm. because then I, it pops through the mulch and then I got to like get my hands in there and take them out and they're an eyesore and I really want that coveted neighborhood. You know, I don't think there is one. Is my there old an award? They there was out? in my old neighborhood, a yard of the week. Um, Ooh, oh, I would love I that. Would, I oh, would my goodness. never win that ever. Oh, that would be a dream for me to compete. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I have a nice like yard, but uh, mainly because there's landscaping and things like that that were done before. Mm. But I'm the guy that refuses to pay. Like, yeah. I do my own like sodding and that sodding, you know, sod every year. <laughs> That's how good I, that no wonder I have weeds. I do my own fertilizing and then all that kind of stuff throughout the year. I mean, yeah, I'm right there with you. I do my own mowing. <laughs> I mow my own lawn <laughs> as well. And so I just haven't perfected getting the dandelions so, out. Oh, less shoot. weeds. Mm-hmm. I don't mind them because it makes my bald yard look fuller. If I get some weeds in there, <laughs> some crab grass, yeah. clover, it's like, ah. Oh. And then when I mow the dandelions, they're just green. They kind of blend in. And it counts the blocks. You know, things are a little different. You know, you know me, trust me. with my pool out yeah. in West yeah, we have a certain standard I, we have to keep. I will say I live in like you a his, more tan, Alex. Histor- <laughs> it's the pool time. Yeah. Pool time. <laughs> I live in like a historical area, so the neighbors are probably a little more uh, like care about their lawn and i try to but i'm just really bad at it i don't what's the opposite of a green thumb i don't know um brown i was gonna say that but that just sounded weird to me yeah, <laughs> that <sounds> weird. <laughs> <laughs> but jess what do you need less of i don't know now you have me thinking about um <laughs> outdoor <laughs> the outdoors it's that time of year it We're is outdoors more. so when we bought our house a couple of years ago um it's an it's an older house not historic though mm-hmm. um but the, the people that owned it just chose to do some random stuff to the house. And so they have like one side of the house is one kind of these little pebbly rocks. And the other side is another huh. kind of a river rock. And I get so annoyed because I am the outdoors. Like I, I like mm. to mow and do all the outdoor stuff. And I am just so tired of I've probably picked up like 10 five gallon buckets of rocks just mm. like out of the yard out of different places trying to make it look nice because i really would love to compete with like if i had a yard a yard beautification co- competition i would love it my goal because we live in an elderly um neighborhood is to have the little ladies when they walk past be like your yard is so beautiful oh, like the, the red hat yeah well, whoever hat i don't club. care if you're walking a dog <clears throat> Yeah, I don't care. So, so you, what do you I need less of? Though? Ro- these rocks. Oh, less just, rocks. Thorn- <laughs> We're just taking this all it's yard. It's a thorn in my side. I but okay. yes, now you've got me in this yard. Uh, this yard kick. Okay. Now I feel this weird pressure to have me mine be something. I can think of something else. Yard less. Go for it. I don't know. It doesn't have to be yard. Less she just yard. I, I set I, an example. Jess likes to follow me. You a triggered lot. me. Oh, so, okay. A little bit, and I do. I I think you have good points. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell us. I, Eric. I don't know. I'm trying. Now I feel. I think I thought I knew what I needed less of, but I just don't. We now that we brought up you. something so deep, yeah. You're like, how do I compare? How do I even compare to this? No, these weeds. No, Eric, I need less we, weeds in my this life. This is where we know? I need to love and <laughs> accept you. <clears throat> Whatever it is, Eric, you can tell us. Oh yeah. Um, I need less. I, I don't know. I don't need, I need less, you know, less maybe 
weird Facebook interactions. That would be good. You know, mm-hmm. I've ha- I feel like I've made a move recently to just like post less in general. And so that's been nice because I haven't had as many interactions, but it's just like, I sometimes you just feel like posting something, you know, sometimes yeah. you just have a thought and you're Get like, little... I just want to put it out there. I just need to put this out there. It's not, you know, it's not always like I'm, I'm looking for an argument. I just want to put the thought out there. But then I always get I always get the someone who wants mm-hmm. to who just wants to debate you. And I'm honestly, people don't believe me, but a lot of times I'm not even interested in the debate. I just want to put the thought out there. You know, just like everybody else mm-hmm. in America and the world on social media, they just want to be seen and heard and feel special for a moment. Uh yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Less stressful uh social media interactions would be good. That's what I want. There. The weeds of the social weeds media. of social media. Oh. Really, it's all just a, bring it back. just a really good metaphor. Uh, anyways, well, uh, today we are continuing our series on yeah. sexuality. So we have another guest lined up. Yeah, Holly is going to be joining us. I, I I'm excited to have Holly. We'll talk a little bit more how we met and things like that. But just as a reminder, we we said this last week. But our goal in these conversations are just to position ourselves. Mm-hmm. And our listeners, just in proximity of people who are just either part of this community or Holly uh, is a mom who's gone through uh, with one of their kids transitioning, being a part of this community and answering a lot of those questions. And so we're just going to ask her questions, hear her story, uh, not debate theology uh, here, but we just want to to have that conversation with her. And we're willing to have those theological conversations. If you're someone that wants to, you can contact us, but we've just seen... Uh, through ministry, through Jess's profession and counseling, that the best, safest place to have that is not always with bright lights, but uh, in a place where we can talk about, hey, what's our stance on scripture? How do we interpret scripture? Our own sin problems can come out in those kind of conversations. And that just takes a tremendous amount of respect Mm -hmm. and trust. And we know God does incredible things in those moments, but we don't have a desire to use our podcast as a soundbite to throw against other people mm-hmm. and be a weapon used against people in this community, but hopefully help us learn, uh, engage with one another and, uh, and not really change our positions, but maybe change our posture towards people. So here we go. Yeah. Good. That's up next. Holly, thanks for joining us. Appreciate having you here. Uh, You're here to have a conversation about your child who is part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, But before we get into that conversation, do you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm first a mom um, and I'm married and I have um, a really strong faith. My faith has been really important to me my entire life. And it has um, been with me since I was um, in elementary school. Yeah, so awesome. that's you've got three kids, right? Yes. So we're going to be talking about one of the, uh, probably your entire family dynamic right. today a little bit. And so, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Holly and I, we kind of go way back. We got to work on staff <laughs> at a, another church together and just have developed a relationship. And even she's someone as we, as she's been navigating, this is someone I've been able to call and ask questions to pop into her office and uh, have just really admired her ministry, the way she's been handling this. And, um, and we've had these kind of conversations often. Uh, and so, yeah, just grateful to have you on this. And well, so thanks for having me. Yep. I appreciate it. So I think one of the first things is you, you said you were raised, you know, faith was a, an important part of you, uh, and part of your, your experience growing up. And so you grew up in the Omaha ish area, right. And a pretty conservative place, I think, especially having conversations around, uh, topics, even like a label, probably like LGBTQIA plus is something you didn't grow up knowing or hearing like what, what that look like in school or how many interactions did you have in church or how did you hear about these, this kind of, you know, sexual identity issues or whatever that might be, uh, just kind of growing up. So I guess church, school, family, what did it look like? Right. So 
at at school, I learned the word homosexuality and what that meant. There was no morality attached to that. I definitely had the morality in the background um, growing up in the church and had some opinions about it. Um, with church, I definitely got the message that homosexuality was a sin and it was wrong um, and it was a choice um, to participate in homosexuality. I absolutely loved the church that I grew up in and I was a good child who wanted to follow the rules and do what was right. So um, I just thought I should avoid being gay or <laughs> being homosexual, I guess. And um, my family, we grew up listening to Focus on the Family. I don't know if anybody's aware of that, mm. but um, the way I kind of look at Focus on the Family now is kind of listening to one news source only on a topic. And um, so very conservative, um, I do remember my parents having a friend that was gay. They were getting a divorce and it was like I was hearing a secret or mm -hmm. something that I should sort of keep underground um, learning about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful to, to know. Um, you guys have thoughts, questions, Jess? <laughs> well, it sounds like I just even growing up in a community like that, I feel like I can even relate to that. And I feel like a lot of us, especially in the area, the Midwest, we could definitely relate. So then coming out of a school, church, family environment like that, then how did that shape your viewpoints or, or your interactions in the community as you got older? Well, as I got older, um, I started to experience peers coming out. Um, I had a friend in high school um, that I heard kind of through the grapevine that they came out. And I remember my first thought was like, oh, that makes sense, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, I'd known them for a long time. And um, I also had a coworker at one of my first jobs who was gay. And I remember really wanting to share Jesus with them. I mean, I, I, I remember I wanted to, but I had no idea how to. And I felt like it was uh, incompatible, like their lifestyle and faith could not come together. And I, I just felt really hopeless in that um, relationship with that coworker. What um, were there other resources or anything like that that maybe shaped your viewpoint or anything like that? Books, yes, media. Yeah. So um, I happened upon a book called What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. And so good. Yeah, it's a really good book. And I don't remember a ton about it. I knew I needed to learn more about grace. Um, <laughs> but he attended a gay parade with one of his friends. And I remember just kind of being sort of dumbfounded about that approach, thinking, you know, how would you do that if you think this is wrong? Um, and I was really surprised, convicted. Um, and I just thought, so there may be ways to support, um, relate, connect with someone who's LGBTQ, but that I didn't do anything with that. I mean, it was just something like, oh, hmm, that's interesting. So that, that work relationship as you process like, hey, I don't see these two as compatible, just kind of how you were grown, how, how you were raised, how you grew up. And you're like hearing, like, did that, did you just decide, hey, that relationship is going to end. We're going to keep that very superficial. There's just things I don't ever get to talk about or like how, how did that relationship end? Were you just like, oh, they're homosexual. I'm not, I can't be a part of their life. And we're just going to, you do you, I'm going to do me. Or, or how did that grow? Well, we were, I mean, cordial and as friendly as we could be. But yeah, there was no um, pressing in, going towards um, this person. And um, and I remember really feeling sad and wanting to be supportive or encouraging. Um, I wanted to bring hope to them, but I just didn't feel like I knew how to do that. And I honestly, growing up, a lot of times I thought sin or things that were wrong or being taught wrong were things that I should keep it far away, stay away yeah. from the people that drink, stay away mm -hmm. from the people that do drugs or what are who have premarital sex, just stay away from all of that. And so I, I didn't know how to press in at all. Um, so I, I just kind of remember when I left that job, we, we didn't have a connection. There wasn't Facebook back then. <laughs> it was yeah. hard to believe. Um, but yeah, so we didn't really keep in touch or anything, but um, it, it affected me. 
Yeah, I remember uh, like all those things, like feeling like those are diseased people. You know, so you got to stay away from people that are gay, have alcohol, or like you said, Mm -hmm. in purity culture that have sex out. If you like get too close to them, (laughs) you might catch. Then you're gonna catch, you know, whatever they have, and then you're gonna be a sinner. So that's, I totally, growing up in that kind of same culture, feel that. So, Mm -hmm. but also feeling that growing up in that culture, but then. I can also see in you of like, there's this twinge of, okay, some, there's got to be something more. There's more to the story or there's more to this relationship of like this, is this always how it has to be is we're just pushing these people away or we can't interact with them. And so I just see that in you of, okay, I want to interact or like, how do I bridge this? Right. And I did find some friends seem to be more at ease at doing that than me. Um, I think my personality was very black, right? Black and white, Mm -hmm. trying to be good, being a good Christian. And I just, I I had no idea. And my emotional intelligence at that time was not very high either. (laughs) Not you. Amen for me. Amen for me. Mine was Yeah, it was like, you know, (laughs) become a Christian and Jesus loves you and just do this. You know, it just, I I really didn't know what I was doing. Let's, Let's dive in a little bit into your child's story and okay. yeah. what that was like when maybe their coming out story right. or yeah. how some of that happened. So it was a really um, interesting process. And I want to thank you again, Alex, for asking me to do this because it caused me to have conversations with my child and conversations with my husband. And um, basically the way I remember the story and the way sh- they remember the story are different. Mm. Um, so they remember being at a doctor's office filling out a form and this topic must have come up and there must be something to check. And so, and, but it wasn't a dramatic um, situation or there was no um, back and forth response from me. I probably was sort of like processing it all. Um, And so, but what I remember is being on Instagram and having this post that was like, I'm this and thinking, oh, um, is this how you want to tell everyone and getting up and finding my child at the moment and saying, hey, is this how we want to tell grandma and everyone in our family? Is this is this how we're doing this? And um, and I was very concerned about my image Mm. and what people were going to think about me in that situation, which makes me really sad that that was something that I was concerned about Mm. um, at that time. Mm. Yeah. So so after your child came out, right? you've already alluded to a couple things, but what were your stages of feelings and emotions as you were walking through that time? So my child was about sixth, seventh grade. Um, And so my first thought was something like, well, do they know? Like, do they really know Mm -hmm. that they, is this something that's just in the water and all middle schoolers are coming out right now? Um, I just, I I wasn't sure if they had thought about it a ton. Um, And so I guess I I, I treaded on it very lightly. Um, And then I guess it didn't take too long for me to think this isn't really going away. This is something that I need to figure out how to navigate and accept. Um, And so I did. I just was like, this must be, this is their truth. And Mm -hmm. so here we are. Yeah. So as you, as you've, you know, walked through that and thinking maybe, Hey, this is a phase. What what were things that like led you down that path of, okay, this isn't just, because I think for people I've had conversations with, their teens, their adolescents, you know, one day you're a skater, you know, the next day, like for me growing up one day, I I wanted to be a skater and that was a huge part of my identity. Everyone needed to know that the next day I wanted to be preppy and you know, whatever that looks like. So, Mm -hmm. so as you're wrestling through, okay, how much of this is a phase? How much of this is rebellion? I think those are natural Mm -hmm. things that happen. Right. What are the, the, I guess the steps in like, did you just wake up one day and like, okay, I'm going to accept this as their truth or what were like the indicators? How long did it linger for you to say, okay, this isn't going away. Does that, does that make right. sense? I would think it was um, under six months um, of time that, you know, time tells a lot of things. Um, I remember just the two of us went swimming and had a conversation and, and it was a, it was a pivotal moment for me kind of letting, um, 
this kind of sink in. I think it took a while, almost like shock, denial, um, and then sort of this is isn't seeming to go away. Mm. So I mean, there were relationships and it just wasn't going away. <laughs> and it seems like you guys had a healthy relationship throughout this where you could dialogue because that's not everyone's case, I think as well. Yeah. You know, I'm very critical of myself. I would have liked to have done things better, but then when I do look back on it, I mean, we were talking, I mean, this wasn't like, um, they felt safe to talk to me. Yeah, it wasn't pack up and move by. No, right. No, yeah. <laughs> that didn't happen. No. Yeah. So in that time too, what were conversations like with your husband as you were looking right. at Right. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when you kind of meet a situation as a couple because mm-hmm. you come from totally different perspectives and totally different things. And so I think we both just had a lot of different emotions, a lot of different responses, a lot of different like ideas of what to do next. Um, but really, we just settled on, well, we know that we love our child. Yes. <laughs> we know that we want our child to feel loved and feel safe here at the, our home. We know we want to have a relationship with our child from now forward, no matter what, where or what they do. And so we just both agreed upon that. And we both made a decision to lean in relationally. Um, And we did it in our own different ways. But I think it was kind of a pivotal time in middle school anyway, to start to say, who is this person? Mm -hmm. Um, How do we get to know them? How do we support them? How do we help them and coach them in their future? And you had mentioned earlier um, how a lot of times it was kind of about what your own fears about how people would perceive you Mm -hmm. and your family. Mm -hmm. Um, How did you get over that or get through that? And is it even something you fully get over or is it something that you still kind of struggle with in general? Well, I mean, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do this interview. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So so this is, you know, probably the biggest way I've ever shared, um, you know, anything. I remember... Um, w- kind of being worried about safety mm-hmm. um, for my child. Um, also kind of what friends or family would think. Um, I, I have also learned in my faith that I have an audience of one, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I'm really only serving one person. And so I think that definitely helped me just to say, you know, it doesn't really matter what everyone else thinks. Um, I have, Heavenly Father that loves me and is walking with me and really understands where I'm coming from. Um, So I guess, I don't know if that answers the question completely. Um, Well, I think it, I think it's a process because I, 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 in my own parents, you know, life, I think there's the process of maybe a kid coming out and, and then there's like the process as a parent of you coming out as a parent who has a kid that is, that is wrestling with this kind of stuff. And like, where, where do I have a safe place to share this? Especially in a, I think a church culture or a very conservative culture that does say, it must've been some parenting issue. It must've been a parenting flaw right. or it must've been you, you accessing this or must've been the friends you let them hang out with, right. or it must've been all of these, uh, maybe na- nurture kind of things. Yeah. And so, and you worked, you know, you and your husband both worked in the religious world, right. you know, at the time. Right. And so, um, I guess what was it like, or what were the pressures like as a parent? Cause I don't, we talk about the person coming out, but were, did you feel equal pressure? Like, coming out to people or how do I navigate who's safe for me to talk to about this? Should I post this on social media? When do I do it? (laughs) Hello everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, it was, it was definitely a difficult thing for me to navigate, but working with middle school and high school students, I sort of see my parenting role changing and it's not really, it was really, I feel like it really wasn't my story to tell. And so, yeah, it, it, there really was only sharing with a very, very, very small group of people, people Mm. that I've earned trust over in decades. (laughs) Um, so I, I didn't really feel safe. So it's kind of tiptoed into some really closer relationships and having conversations. Um, but I have no need to, you know, post, on social media. I mean, obviously if there's a wedding someday, that would seem to be an appropriate time to maybe share some pictures or whatever, but I haven't really felt like I need to make an announcement to people. I would guess that some people in my community of faith know, 
um, or just perceive that or guess or guessing. Um, but yeah, we're not wearing t-shirts at church or anything. <laughs> hey, everyone, you know, so does that help? Yeah, I think that's helpful. And how does how does your child respond to that? Because I think right. some would think that maybe you're not supportive right. because, you know, you should jump on, you know, a pride bandwagon or things like, like you should as someone who's supportive, what it means to be um, an advocate, you right. know, or, or whatever is to do that, you know, to embrace, you know, on Facebook, I'm an advocate or there's, yeah. you know, different kind of like put a rainbow flag up or, or things like that. So do you guys ever have, does your child feel not supported because you're not putting it out there on social media or how's that? I don't know if I want to answer that because I don't really know. Okay. Um, mm. But I do think um, they were very concerned about what I would face. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that was something that was sort of surprising to me yeah. is it, they were very concerned about um, what are people going to think of you mm. as a parent? Wow. And um, so that's not their job to be thinking mm -hmm. about that, but it was. And I mean, the position that we're in um, and the community that we have, I can understand why it came up or it was a thought of theirs. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that just shows emotional intelligence on their part. I think, right. To, oh, yeah. To Absolutely. Have some yeah. Concern, so. so how have you processed this internally with God being in the faith community and right. being raised in a Christian home, raising your family that way. How have you processed that with him? Yeah. Well, I definitely prayed a lot and my relationship with God is pretty intense. I felt like I could just tell God anything, say anything. So God became kind of the place to, to just say it all, not worry about, you know, God judging me. I don't mm -hmm. see God that way as this, like, I'm just going to get you and take you down, Holly. So I just, I, there was a lot of conversation. I love the Psalms because it really just helps me approach God and just run to him. And so I prayed a ton, um, definitely went to scripture because I had been taught scripture about this, but I hadn't really done the research myself. So um, in an intense way. <laughs> so I, I really went to scripture um, and listened to anything that I could get my hands on. Um, so Have you had a process of seeking out new friends who are parents um, of children in a similar situation or any, anything like that? Yeah. So this situation really opened up an opportunity for me to walk towards the LGBTQI plus community, um, attend parades, um, start paying attention to what you know, other people are going through what other parents are going through. And, you know, we serve a good God. He definitely had people in my life already that were walking this path as a parent. And we just slowly entered into conversations about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I really have appreciated not being alone in this journey. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's good. So as you are learning, I mean, this is, this is still going to be a process, I think anybody that's a parent, my parents are still learning things as, as they parent me, even though it's different. I'm an adult, mm -hmm. you know, um, they still love me and, and care about me and are proud of me. And I think a lot of times as parents, we want to produce a product, you know, for oh, lack right. of better words that we can put on a shelf and people are able to see and that we did that. We raised them. So what are things that you're learning as you are just from your child, because you already shared that a little bit, but what are things that you're learning from your child as you as you guys interact? You said earlier about just even some of their emotional intelligence of right. asking me that question and feeling empathy for me of what I would have to go through. What are other things you're learning from them? Yeah, if you guys haven't, just your children disciple you. <laughs> um, they disciple you like nothing else. Um, so this has not been an easy path um, for my child to walk. Um, it is not um, simple and um, there's a lot of anxiety um, that comes with it. Uh, so I, I, I've, I've learned that um, 
my child and I do a lot of Enneagram conversation. And so that helps us put language to a lot of things. Um, and they are definitely a technicolor um, personality. They see the world in so many different shades and colors. And, um, and I'm a little bit more stoic, serious, black and white, um, you know, whatever. So um, in my thinking. So it's been really helpful to be my heart to be opened up. Um, I'm definitely not as much of a touchy feely person either. So it's just like, oh, okay, this is just a totally different world for me. Um, And learning how to be more compassionate, um, grow in empathy. Uh, So yeah, many ways. And I love how you said earlier in the conversation that when they first came out to you that you chose to press in relationally right and you're still continuing to do that right making that choice to do that and have those conversations or spending right. time with them yeah so I kind of grew up where parenting is when they're 18 they're done you know that's sort of how I think my parents knew what they knew about parenting and I'm like oh my gosh I've watched other people parent and I'm like this is a coaching thing mm-hmm. forever and you don't ever not want your parents in your life you don't nobody ever wants their parents in, not in their life and um so and my my personal story is I have a parent that's not in my life and so I just that contributed to like I'm going to run after this kid yes. I'm never going to leave so I love that <laughs> they're stuck message. with me I love that just in your testimony in this it's mm-hmm. that's so powerful just for so many of us just to see that and how we need to be pressing into that right yeah Could you share some of your experiences with the church and the LGBTQ community? Is is it positive, negative, a mixed bag? Right. Yeah. Um, Well, it's not an easy place to be LGBTQIA. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are definitely affirming places within church, but, you know, you don't know. Um, I would say they don't feel very safe. There was a lot of anxiety um, going to church, a lot of um, needing to be near me or near my husband um, at church. Um, and, and also kind of a gradual separation I'm seeing of um, just not being as involved, mm-hmm. um, even though I, their faith is important to them um, and exploring that is. So, um Yeah, I feel like the church has a lot of work (laughs) to be done in this area. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know churches fall all over the place and how they view it, but um, we as a church people, um, I would like to see more hospitality, more listening, Mm -hmm. more loving, um, more possibility to have a safe conversation um, in a context of love. Um, I think if our tr- our kids can't figure out how to be who they are within the context of the church, they're go- you know they're going to find it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just I don't know. It, it makes me sad that it doesn't feel like there's a lot of wonderful places for LGBTQI plus people to mm-hmm. be when it comes to their faith. Is it something that you've? I mean, I'm sure you've kind of watched your child progress through this and interact uh, with others in the faith and as well as kind of exploring their own faith. But have you seen uh, that grow in positive ways or do you feel like they're kind of maybe pulling back from their faith because they don't feel as welcome or is that is it just something that you haven't explored that much? Right. Well, our faith is really important to um, me and my husband and our family. So it's Mm -hmm. not just a church thing so we don't really Mm -hmm. separate it much um yeah i don't i don't know yeah i don't (laughs) i don't know i have seen um other i've had other connections in the church besides my child and watching their story i've watched kids be really active and then never come back Mm -hmm. um to our church um and i've also was able to befriend um, an LGBTQI person, plus person. And um, they really, I remember praying with them and just being like, wow, this person is just full of the Holy Spirit. And mm-hmm. we're praying here together. And it was it was just a moving experience, but they, need, they felt the need to leave 
and find a church that they felt was more affirming. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, there's just been a, there's just a lot of loss um, connected to, to this. It doesn't really feel like a upbeat, happy, <laughs> you know, it's, there's some sadness yeah. in it all. And when you use, I guess, the word affirming, do you think, um, I think sometimes people think it's affirming of a person and everything about them, all their choices, affirming theology, affirming we have to land in the same spot. Like when you when you use that word affirming, like some people have to leave a church. Do you think a do you think a church that is conservative theologically on this type of issue can still be a place that provides community and hope and um, life and and redemption? I think it's possible. But you can't keep people at a distance and do that. I mean, you, you have to lean into them. You have to connect with them. If you know, if you walk into an environment, and I, you know, I've seen it where people are uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable being around somebody that doesn't look like them, <laughs> that isn't heterosexual, and they can obviously, or they decide that they figured it out. Um, oftentimes, you watch people, and they'll they'll just kind of it's you know it's almost like there's a virus or something that you're trying to avoid or you're trying to get away from. And I, I think um, like this particular person, if they felt um, embraced, I don't know if they would have, they would have left. Um, but I think it was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. I mean, it's a tough, tough question um, to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and we're institutions and you get in all different semantics of what the church is and the organism versus institution and all that kind of right. stuff as well inside of that. So, and this is your, and this is your story. And again, thank you for, you know, you're saying you being on here. That's a, that's a pretty big deal. You, yeah. You're not the only person <laughs> in this position that I know. Right. And I've, I re reached out to several people, mm -hmm. you know, and I was this the last is, one. <laughs> you weren't the last one. <laughs> no, but, just kidding. And prayed through it. And yeah. this is a difficult conversation mm -hmm. to have right. um, and to go public with because people are wrestling with it. This is, this is real. This isn't just a ballot box issue. This isn't just, you know, it, it's real people and mm -hmm. real families and real experiences. And so just again, thank you for, for being a part of, of that. And so how, how have you processed, you know, with your, and we've even used the word they, their mm -hmm. child yeah. inside of this, how have you personally processed, um, pronoun hospitality, you know, in, in your life and in your family, you know, you gave your, your child a name at birth, right? right. You, for a reason mm -hmm. and it, have they, kept that name. We won't talk about what the name is, but have they kept that name? Have they said, ah, I'd like to go by a different name now mm -hmm. or a different gender, or I want to be identified as this. How, how's that process been for you? Yeah. So they want to be called they, <laughs> and they are not going by the name that they were given at birth. Um, this isn't the first time that um, they've said, I want to be called X, Y, Z. And so I've gone through this process more than once. And um, for me, it's just, you know, they're just habits. When you meet someone for the first time and they tell you their name, you remember that name and you use that name. But mm -hmm. when you have a habit of using a name over and over again, then you you know, it takes some time. Some people are faster than others. I've, I, it's, it's a slow process for me. I don't even call my other children by their names half the time. I'm just like, Hey, you come at whoever's out there, <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, I want to respect, um, what they want to be called. Um, and so I don't have a problem with whatever name they, um, want to go by I me mean, was a little I was a little sensitive their meaning of their name was really important to me but um, they know that and so and they've also kind of incorporated um, their formal or legal name and what they want to be called and um, mm -hmm. at this point haven't taken any legal action for a name change but obviously could so um, one of the things that I experienced before all of this um, before my daughter or my child came out <laughs> um, was that it's something called fresh start. And I, I had a picture of the future of my child mm. and it was painted and it was pretty clear. 
And I learned how to be free in my relationship with God. And in that freedom, I knew I had to let go of that picture. And so it's been really freeing, honestly. And I didn't even know I had it until this happened. So um, I, I just feel like, you know, there's lots of possibilities of the future, but I don't need to hold on to this specific one. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that, I mean, no matter wh- who the parent is, you kind of have this vision of right. of what that future looks like. Mm-hmm. And then, and and there's, I think letting go of that is also, there's a grieving that comes with right. that. It's not, yeah. and that's something that's okay. And it's yeah. not that it's anything against your child. It's just like, I'm relinquishing this mm-hmm. now that I've maybe maybe I've put it on a pedestal or maybe I shouldn't have, I've given it undue, right. you know, um, priority in my life, but yeah. there is a grieving process. Mm-hmm. How, how do you, how do you speak life and identity into your child in areas outside of sexuality? Well, I love the question. Um, I'm being very intentional about doing better with this. Um, I have wanted to be a better encourager um, and affirmer. <laughs> Um, and I've mentioned it earlier, but one way that I do that, um, that we connect is through the Enneagram. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just been really helpful for us. We type people in TV shows together. <laughs> I mean, we've really gone, we're both super deep into the Enneagram almost on a crazy level that everyone else in the family is just like, oh my gosh, stop talking about that. So, um, but yeah, it's really important to me to identify each of my children's gifts and talents and help launch them into the big wide world. And um, and so, yeah, we like to celebrate who they are and what they do and um, and just make sure ultimately that they know that they're loved in this con, you know, in the yeah. context of their life in our family, that they belong and, and they're loved. Yeah. So then with the rest of your family, how do you have this conversation with your other children who obviously have, would have their own thoughts and opinions, ideas about right. your child, yeah, their sibling? So um, one of my favorite professors at Grace um, would often teach, I remember specifically on divorce, would say, this is divorce. And these are the different ways that people look at divorce. And so that's sort of the approach that we've taken is just more like, okay, these are the scriptures that are here. And these are the different opinions that people have. And we want you to formulate your own opinion. We invite you to, you know, pray about it, think about it um, in your own relationship. And obviously, Obviously, it also connects with their age appropriateness <laughs> in these conversations. We, we mm-hmm. meet them where they are and, and a lot of times when they're asking, you know, when they're asking questions. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure my children have totally varying opinions about all of this. Um, and so, yeah, it's just it's. A sense of humor has been really helpful. I mean, we don't have a lot of off topics. I don't think we have very many at all in our home. And so, yeah, we talk about things. We, you know, come up with our opinions. And I think my, you know, all my children know sort of where the other children stand. And I hope it's still a safe place for them all. So, um, yeah, it just, it's not, you know, the... To me, it's not the most important issue. I want my children's hearts to be um, sought after with God. Mm -hmm. I want them to have this relationship with God at the end of the day. And so um, it just needs to be a safe place for them to learn and discover what they think, because ultimately I want them to have their own faith and their own ideas and their own thoughts and not just regurgitate whatever they were told Mm -hmm. to think, Um, because that's kind of how I think I grew up. So kind of going in a different direction. I like that. Speaking of people's opinions, <clears throat> there's going to be parents that listen to this, other parents that listen to this that are, you know, and we get this a lot. Get off the fence. You know, Connor, <laughs> even who we had last week, yeah. was like, he listens to our show mm-hmm. and was like, I sit there and I'm like, get off the fence. And our hope is to build empathy and bridges for people and not tell people how to think because mm-hmm. I believe Amen. that scripture, if we seek truth and we and we pray about it, that the Holy Spirit is far better at convincing and convicting people mm-hmm. than I ever will be. And I want people to be convinced and convicted by truth and not by Alex's version of truth. And so there's going to be people that we just know that Mm -hmm. are like, think everything you're doing is wacky, you know, that love and truth have to, can't be separated, that loving them. And so what would you say to a parent that's like, Holly, you're wrong, you know, not in my house. 
Okay, that you're just wrong to even let let that go on in your house. You be the parent. Mm-hmm. You're the authority figure. They can figure it all out when when they get out. You know, then you let them do it. But right now, they need to abide by Holly's world, <laughs> the name you gave them, the right. gender that that yeah. you birthed them at. Like they need to do that and then figure it out yourself because you, you're wrong. Right. I'm I'm sure you've had that conversation or yeah or so how how do you navigate that? Well, I have been wrong about how I've approached scripture and how I've seen scripture and I could still be wrong to this day. I mean, I don't think that I finished and that I know exactly what God is saying in all of scripture and have a perfect understanding of it. You know, it seems real simple when you look at scripture, but it's not, (laughs) I mean, it's not all that simple. You know, my views have changed on women in ministry. I, didn't see myself um, having any options um, in college for being a woman in ministry. And so, um, so my, and I was very strong on that, you know, anti women in ministry as a woman who felt called by the Holy Spirit to be in ministry. Um, So I've been wrong. Mm -hmm. I've been wrong. Um, And I think people do the best they can in teaching me. Churches have done amazing job of investing in me, but they could be wrong. And so I think I first, had to start out with this, what if we're wrong? What if we got this wrong? And how much at the end of the day is God un- concerned about if I'm right or wrong? Uh, or is he more concerned about how much I love him and my relationship with him? And so um, I don't want to get it wrong. I want to get it right. I want to get parenting right. But <laughs> if you parent, you, you're not going to get it right every day. And so I guess I, I feel like I would like to have a more ongoing, fluid relationship with God where, gosh, I could be wrong about a lot of things. I might not know a lot of things. There might be so much more to learn that I don't know after going to college and being in ministry for a long time. There still could be so much more. That's good. Yeah, it's a humble, humble approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I, I bet all of us around the <laughs> table feel the same about yes. multiple issues in, in Scripture where God's continuing to to reveal truth to us and convict us and uh and he does it at different rates to everybody mm-hmm. in different spaces mm-hmm. we all have <laughs> our own things that uh he's he's working on all of us in and it's probably different for each of us in the room so that's good that's helpful and you know, again you know as we we continue to thank you for this because i know this is something that is uncomfortable to do and uh, I guess as we kind of wrap things up here, is there anything that you would share for a parent who's listening to this and they are kind of in your same situation mm-hmm. and what what is there any type of hope or anything that you can give them or some sort of um, inspiration, you know, if they're right. really struggling right now? Yeah, well, the LGBTQI topic um, for a child often comes with a lot of other topics, um, Mm -hmm. substance abuse, um, anxiety, depression. um, And so I I guess I I would encourage a parent to to get some help Mm -hmm. around it, um, to be able to find safe places to process their own um, thoughts and emotions. Um, and I would encourage them to be slow. I mean, to take their time in what they might want to do to not react or respond in a very concrete way that could do a lot of damage um, to a child or to their relationship because parents love their kids and <laughs> kids love their parents and mm-hmm. kids want to make their parents proud. And, um, kids want to hear from their parents that they're loved and that um, their parents are proud of them. And so, um, and they go through a lot of ways to try to, to get that, that response from us. And I think sometimes we forget that that's a real thing. Um, So I would just encourage them to take their time, to be slow, to um, listen, to not feel like they have to make some sort of harsh decision. Um, and, and to learn what, what about this is triggering them and why, are, why you know, can they separate themselves a little bit from yeah. this and see their, pers- their child as 
another human being or another person? Like, would they respond the same way if it was the neighbor down the street or whatever? Yeah. And so you have to kind of, as a parent, it's it's very different than just knowing someone in the office that you know is homosexual or something. Yeah. It's very different. And so, um, and in the faith community, it's it's pretty complicated yeah. for most people. That's really helpful. That is helpful. Thank you again for your time. Of we course. really appreciate that. It's it's been insightful and nuanced, and we um, hope that this is something that can bless people who are listening and help them wherever they're at. Right. Uh, and if anybody has any questions or concerns, we'd love to hear from you as well. You can reach out to us on social media at CCC Omaha, or you can send us an email to podcast at cccomaha.org. We'd love to hear from you. Until then, we'll talk to you later. 